But anyway, I want to thank you all for, in such a short notice, to, to put this together is really uh, speaks volume of your commitment to teaching and education. I really appreciate all of you. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this uh, second webinar series uh, that's been uh, put together by the Cardiovascular Innovation Foundation. Uh, I'm grateful to our guests and panelists today. On behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Subhash Banerjee, Manos Berlakes and Paul Saraja, and myself, Meli Shishabur. Uh, it's an honor in short time to have these four experts guests to join us. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our four guests. The topic today is ECMO indication uh, approach uh, in the setting of uh, COVID-19. So for patients with COVID-19, there's been a lot of question and interest. Uh, so we put a panel together to discuss this. This is interactive. Uh, please make sure you send us your questions through the chat and we will be able to ask those uh, of the, our panelists, expert panelists. Our uh, uh, guests are uh, Dr. Melissa Bronswald, uh, Associate Professor of Surgery from University of Minnesota. Melissa, please say hi so people can see you. Uh, we couldn't hear you, Melissa, so make sure your phone is working. I'm just, this is also a check. Um, hello, yep, hello, sorry. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, our second guest is Dr. Amy Hackman, Surgical Director of ECMO at the UT Southwestern. Uh, Amy, say hi, please. Hi, everybody. And uh, our third guest is Dr. Mark Pelletier. Uh, he's the Chief of uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center and my partner. Mark, please say hi. Thanks, Maddie, and hi, everybody. And then lastly, we have uh, Dr. Kasia uh, Rino Rinovich. I knew I was gonna mess it up. She, she corrected me a couple of times, but I did my best, so I apologize, Kasia. Please say hi uh, so that everybody get to meet you. Thanks so much. So let's get it started. You know, we're gonna get it started here. Our first presentation is by Dr. Um, Amy um, uh, Hackman, and the presentation is gonna be ECMO indication for COVID-19 patients, how to select and timing. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to specifically talk about respiratory ECMO, then the next speaker will cover more of the cardiac component. Um, I do have some disclosures, um, just to give those. Uh, I work with both Abbott Medical and Medtronic. Um, and also ECMO is off-label use uh, for adults in the United States. So why are we here today talking about this? Um, this graph just shows what we've seen online of the increasing number of COVID cases in the United States over the last few weeks. Today, we'll probably cross the 100,000 positive tests in the United States. And that probably underrepresents the total number of cases. Again, those are just the ones that have a test positive. So what happens to those patients in the US? Right now, the number of serious cases is somewhere around 2,500 patients, which means patients admitted to the ICU. Um, there've already been close to 1,500 deaths in the US as well. And uh, we'll talk about how many patients in the U.S. have been on ECMO to date in a little bit. So let's say there's just a million cases in the United States. Uh, based on data from around the world, uh, 25 to 30 percent of those patients get admitted to the hospital. So that's 300,000 hospital admissions. Do you know how many hospital beds there are in the U.S.? About 500,000. So where are all the other patients going to go? And let's say 15 to 20% of those patients get admitted to the ICU, half of which will be intubated. There's only about 100,000 ICU beds in the United States. So again, displacing a large number of patients that need care uh, in order to care for only COVID patients. And around the world, about one out of 10 patients uh, that are intubated may require ECMO. So in the US, that could be 2,500 ECMO patients. We know there are about 65 or 70 registered adult ECMO centers. So we don't know the true capacity for ECMO patients, but the, uh, the potential is very large uh, of patients might need respiratory ECMO. Uh, as a com comparison, the 2009 H1N1 epidemic, only 600 patients in the United States received ECMO. So this could be a significantly larger number of patients. When looking at the physiologic criteria of who needs ECMO for respiratory support, these are kind of the standard physiologic criteria we use. The most common being for hypoxia, a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 100 
despite maximal ventilator and adjunctive support. And what that might be includes prone positioning, um, using pulmonary vasodilators, prolonged PEEP of 12 to 15, high FiO2 over 80%, paralytics, so pretty aggressive ventilator support, and yet the patient remains hypoxic. Sometimes we see complications from these very high pressure ventilation settings, such as subcutaneous emphysema or pneumothorax, and that can be another indication for ECMO. Or in a patient with a persistent uh, respiratory acidosis from hypercapnia. And those are the main physiologic criteria we use for respiratory support. So what might be different in a patient with respiratory failure from COVID-19? We know that these patients may present with very profound hypoxia. Sometimes they come from home with saturations in the 50s or 60s, PaO2 is measured in the 30s. Uh, in addition, patients have been reported to have a very rapid deterioration. For instance, they go from uh, home uh, to intubated in less than 24 hours. Uh, CT scans of the chest have been used as screening, which may show a patchy ground glass opacity. Uh, frequently, the chest x-ray may be misleading about what's going on with the patient, but the CT can be more diagnostic. Interestingly, these patients have a normal lung compliance, which is very different from typical ARDS, and we'll show some images of that in a moment. Uh, reports from especially Italy say they're requiring very high PEEP on their patients, um, 12 to 15 to maintain oxygenation, but the patients do respond to this high PEEP, and they also respond to prone positioning to improve their oxygenation. Uh, there have been varying reports, uh, but most centers have said that the patients don't improve with pul pulmonary vasodilators like nitric oxide or epoprostenol. So if you look at the image on the left, it's a CT scan in standard ARDS, for instance, from influenza. And you see the lung is very densely consolidated. And this is a very inflammatory consolidation of the lung. In the operating room, if we were to feel these lungs, they would feel like livers. They're so densely consolidated. And then on the right, you see images from COVID. Um, the upper chest x-ray, you can see this may be just misinterpreted as pulmonary edema from heart failure and not the viral pneumonitis that it is. And in the CT image, you see these very patchy ground glass opacities. Our standard contraindications for respiratory support with ECMO um, are relative contraindications, and probably most people, if you ask, have violated these relative contraindications on a re regular basis. So generally, if anticoagulation is contraindicated, if they have irreversible cardiopulmonary disease, um, for a patient that's not a candidate for a transplant or advanced therapy, a patient that's been mechanically ventilated for longer than seven to 10 days, patients with poor pre-existing functional status, uh, those that have pre-ECMO neurological injury, patients with severe sepsis without source control, patients with major bleeding or clotting disorders, advanced age, and that definition varies again by what and sometimes what your age is, multiple organ dysfunction, lack of an access site for ECMO cannulation, uh, patients' unwillingness to accept blood transfusions, or advanced malignancy. Uh, ELSO does have available these survival calculators, um, the RESP score, which can help predict your patient's survival um, from respiratory ECMO, and the SAVE score, which can help predict your patient's survival from uh, cardiac support. Um, they don't include some of the common indications for ECMO, but both do have a calculation for viral illnesses, both the respiratory disease and viral myocarditis. The cannulation strategies for VV ECMO vary. Uh, my preferred is actually letter B, which is uh, two femoral cannulas, uh, also commonly performed as one femoral and one IJ cannula. And also there's the double lumen cannula coming from the IJ vein, which is letter C. In, uh, especially in a patient that's been placed prone, I prefer using only the femoral veins because as the patient's being positioned supine, there's a lot of activity as they're trying to reposition the ET tube, reposition the central lines, et cetera. And I can work in the groin uh, without being in the way of the others that need to position near the head. Um, C, the double lumen cannula, I would not recommend, especially in an urgent cannulation, as this typically does require image guidance for this cannula placement. Um, I would commonly recommend using both fluoroscopy and echo to place this cannula. And doing that in a patient that uh, um, has a very high viral load exposes a lot of people. 
I did the VA V ECMO, which is a combination of VV and VA ECMO. Uh, for patients that require cardiac support but also have lung injury from COVID, they will likely require this VAV strategy in order to prevent differential hypoxemia or the north south syndrome. Um, it's important to know that when you do this cannulation, you have to limit your flow to the venous side because it's the low pressure system. So normally flow would preferentially go to the venous because you want most of the blood to return to the aorta to support the circulation and just a low amount of flow, usually a liter of flow is enough to support the oxygenation. So when should we place someone on support? Uh, to be fair, it probably depends on the resources that you have available at the time. Um, today, what patients might qualify for ECMO will be different than maybe in three weeks. And that's something that uh, when I built the plan at my institution, and I know others have done as well, we made stages uh, in our ECMO criteria such that if re resources were becoming limited, we might limit who we offered ECMO to or might not be able to offer ECMO at all. Um, Especially in the EOLIA trial, we know that earlier support tends to have better survival, although it was not statistically significant. It likely would have been if they'd completed that trial. So recognizing a patient that's failing your other therapies and initiating support early does give the best outcome. And especially in a, in a patient that is very sick, avoiding an emergent procedure, again, with the risk of exposure to the healthcare providers, um, is of good benefit to everyone to not have it be an emergency, but plan ahead and place the patient on ECMO early uh, instead of waiting uh, till the patient is crashing. So some of the scenarios that we've seen are kind of similar to that ethical situation you were assigned in medical school. Who would you let on the lifeboat with you? So who of these patients would you cannulate? Um, the young person, but with some serious medical problems, an older person that's a practicing physician, um, does BMI play a role? Um, does post-transplant status play a role? Again, these are all based on conversations uh, different physicians have had recently about who they would cannulate for ECMO with COVID positive. So it's important to have a discussion in your center about who you think would have the best chance for survival and pick those patients uh, to be placed on ECMO, as this will be likely a limited resource in the very new, near future. Currently in the US, uh, just from asking around other centers, there's about 50 patients that have been supported on ECMO. There have already been five decannulations, uh, most of which were successful. Mostly these were VV ECMO cases. The average time on support currently has been around 10 to 14 days. And most of the patients have been younger than 50 years old. So a younger population than maybe was seen in other countries. Thank you very much. That was uh, truly fantastic, uh, Amy. I'm really, uh, honestly, I learned so much myself. Uh, I'd like to open it up for five to six minutes of questions. We will have more Q&A at the end of all the presentations, but a specific to yours, uh, maybe I can start with one question and then you know my colleagues, uh, Dr. Banerjee and uh, Berlakis are also monitoring and also other uh, guests can chime in. Uh, the one question I had was what you mentioned about VV, VA, ECMO and the volume uh, that you need, uh, you know, the, uh, the flow, the flow rates. Um, can you comment, given the issue with oxygenation, and I know that Kasha is going to also talk about the, the left side, the heart issues, uh, the left ventricular issues. Uh, is there anything different in regards to the settings that you recommend, or at least you have heard be recommended for COVID patients that are on VV ECMO relative to, let's say, a patient with a PEE, or, as, or ARDS or something else? So these patients are very hypoxic. And so the only way to oxygenate blood on VV is higher flow. And that's another one of the reasons to not consider the double lumen cannula first, because generally it will be lower flow um, and consider two cannulation sites instead uh, to increase your flow. So I have heard that patients are requiring higher flow, especially initially um, because they're so hypoxic. Uh, and then the, the cardiac support, I'll, I'll let Kasha talk about that in her presentation. Sure. Any other questions well, from the- One more question I see, uh, Medic came from uh, uh, Dr. Moody, a question about the CT sterilization. You mentioned uh, in your talk that CT is uh, done very often to the ground glass of capacities. The question is, um, how do you sterilize the CT scanner afterwards? I know it's less relevant to the ECMO, but I guess a question in many people's minds. 
So um, I saw a video from Singapore that was very informative about both the transport of the patient to CT scan. Um, and in the video, you saw trailing behind the patient down the hallway was EVS actually cleaning the hallway as they went. Um, and then once the CT scan was done, they used, uh, most places I think are using the Xenex system, which has hydrogen peroxide gas to clean the room. Oh, okay. But it does yeah, take an hour or two, um, so it would have to be done when no other patient needs that CT scanner. Amy, one more quick question from uh, on, on the chat line. Your approach to LV when strategy in COVID patients on VA ECMO uh, with uh, some sort of cardiomyopathy. But, and the second question uh, associated with that is that where do you prefer to cannulate? Bedside, cath lab, or where would you do it in a, specifically in a COVID patient? So I typically cannulate in the ICU anyway, um, just be logistically, uh, it's quicker than waiting for an OR team to come and transporting to the OR. Um, so I'm comfortable with doing the cannulation in the ICU and I use um, ultrasound and echo to help guide um, accurate vessel uh, access as well as cannula placement in the heart. Um, so I do prefer to cannulate in the ICU. Um, LV venting, um, if you're on VA ECMO alone, um, you can, again, I prefer an impella if I need to vent the LV. However, they, these patients are not seeming to tolerate only VA ECMO. They need the VAV strategy. Um, and from the reports I've heard, most have not had to vent the LV. Um, that just by correcting the hypoxia, the LV gets better pretty quickly. And we're going to get more into this, if you will, because uh, Dr. Reinovich is going to talk about this. So maybe we move to uh, the next presentation. And I think between Dr. Reinovich and uh, Dr. Pelletier and uh, our other colleagues, you will get many of your questions answered, which are very relevant. So uh, Amy, thank you again. That was wonderful. Please stay with us for the Q&A. Uh, we need your uh, knowledge and your input. I'm gonna ask uh, Kasha to please take over the, uh, the screen at this point. While she's taking over the screen, I'm gonna introduce again one more time her topic. She's going to talk to us about the impact of COVID-19 on the heart and the lungs. As you heard, we are getting a lot of information in regards to how this disease, this virus is affecting both the heart and the lungs. And more importantly, she's going to share with us some theoretical aspect of this, but also some clinical data from China, South Korea, and from the United States and her own expertise. Thank you so much, Kasia. Thank you so much for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so within, um, I have no, no disclosures. Um, so within the next 10, 12 minutes, um, I would like to talk initially about the risk factors that are associated with cardiac complications in COVID-19 patients, and then um, describe a different pathology um, that is associated with that infection that affects the heart and cardiovascular system. And talk a little bit about ACE inhibitors and IRBs. This is something that uh, created a lot of discussions in the cardiology and advanced heart failure world. And also talk about when to think about VA ECMO and an approach to a VAT patient that is infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So based on the initial experience from Wuhan, China, we know that uh, this population of 138 patients had a high prevalence of hypertension, up to one third of patients, CAD, CVA, up to 22% of patients, as well as diabetes, up to 16% of those patients. And then patients who required ICU admission were more likely to have those uh, comorbidities compared with non-ICU patients. And those risk factors were actually um, associated with uh, increased overall mortality for the confirmed uh, COVID-19 patients. And as you see um, on this graph, if you had coronary vascular disease prior to infection, uh, then 10% uh, of these patients um, uh, died, compared to 7.3 with diabetes and 6% of hypertension when the overall mortality in that particular cohort of over 44,000 patients was 2.3%. And I think when we're talking about um, uh, risk factors, we also have to uh, bring up cardiotoxic uh, effects of medications that are now uh, commonly used in this patient population, and especially the first two, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, um, that are often used uh, in combination and are known to uh, prolong QT interval. Now that by itself may uh, lead to a significant arrhythmias, 
um, uh, that can obviously in a very sick uh, population uh, can lead to uh, bad outcomes. Also high dose steroids, which are commonly used in the sickest ones may uh, cause fluid retention um, and IVIG similarly. There is one or couple of cases of remdesivir uh, that was used in the Ebola um, uh, epidemic uh, and uh, was associated with PARS, but that was really, I didn't see any reports in the uh, COVID population. So the um, COVID-19 uh, disease affects the heart uh, in terms of myocardial injury that is uh, defined as elevation in cardiac troponin. And up to 17% of patients, again, all this data is from Wuhan, China. And it's much more common uh, in patients who are uh, admitted to the ICU and those who died. And as you see, 22% of these patients had elevated uh, troponin versus only 2%. The myocardial injury can manifest itself as myocarditis, stress or septic uh, cardiomyopathy, but also demand ischemia. And I think uh, this is why patients with um, pre-existing coronary disease may do uh, much worse uh, than uh, patients without those comorbidities. And interestingly, heart failure and cardiomyopathy in that initial cohort was observed in 23% of patients. And again, the data is quite muddy. It's hard to tell whether these were, some of these patients already had pre-existing cardiomyopathy, or this was a result of myocarditis or stress or septic cardiomyopathy, but obviously that comorbidity puts patients at much higher risk of dying. And cardiac arrhythmia is another one uh, that is described often in, in this patient population. Again, higher in hospitalized patients and higher in ICU population. Interestingly, uh, palpitations were part of the uh, presenting symptoms in over 7% of these patients. Um, and again, um, when you have high fever, not feeling well, you may just feel palpitations and be tachycardic. But we know that these patients are at higher risk of uh, ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death in an arrhythmic mechanism. And again, it's hard to really put our finger on the etiology. I believe it's a combination of metabolic derangement, hypoxia, possibly acute myocarditis, um, especially in patients who have elevated troponins and then medication effect or combination of all of them. And then venous thromboembolic disease, there's again a lot of discussions about it and it's mainly based on the fact that uh, uh, patients um, uh, who didn't do well or um, are doing poorly uh, presented with elevated D-dimer levels and that was strongly associated with in hospital death. And as you see on this graph, uh, the rise occurred relatively early uh, at about seven day. Um, I think it's uh, too early to tell whether it's related to a, a actual thromboembolic disease, a possibly small vessel, a thromboembolic disease, possibly uh, in the lung vasculature. Um, uh, and definitely, uh, again, there's a lot of talk about uh, not jumping into uh, trying to rule out uh, PE in all of these patients who present to the emergency room, otherwise um, who are, uh, high, there's a high suspicion uh, for, for COVID-19 um, infection. And what about ACE inhibitors and ARBs? So when this whole thing started, uh, there was again a lot of discussions about stopping uh, ACE inhibitors and stopping ARBs or possibly switching all patients in, uh, on ACE inhibitors uh, to ARBs, um, especially that uh, uh, is quite important in the heart failure population that we know that those medications uh, 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 improve survival, improve sim symptomatology. And it all derived from in vitro studies that demonstrated um, that this virus and other coronaviruses actually um, are using the angiotensin-converting angiotensin enzyme uh, 2 protein uh, for uh, cell entry. Uh, since then, multiple uh, organizations like WHO and HFSA, ACC, uh, AHA, also European societies recommended that uh, physicians and patients do not discontinue uh, those medications as there is really not enough clinical or scientific evidence uh, unless there are uh, some other contraindications to this uh, treatment. So when to think about uh, VA ECMO in a, a patient uh, uh, with COVID-19? Um, it should be considered in a patient who has ARDS with coexisting cardiogenic shock. And as Amy said, um, the data is very scarce and uh, the initial um, uh, data from China yielded very poor results. I think the problem was because we really didn't know much about those patients. And I think if you are using ECMO or VA ECMO or VV ECMO as a rescue strategy, and we know that from other trials, EOLIA, we know it from single center experiences, um, as a rescue strategy, it probably won't work. 
I would say in a patient um, uh, with COVID and ARDS, depressed ejection fraction, rising troponin, um, elevating or increasing pressure demands despite adequate oxygenation uh, are things that uh, should prompt us to at least consider VA ECMO. I think hemodynamic assessment would be very uh, helpful, um, but it's rarely feasible and especially in a COVID situation, I think you don't want to put your staff at risk. But uh, looking at the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and cardiac output can um, actually prompt you to one, um, one way or another. Um, and obviously special attention needs to be um, put to age and comorbidities. We know that uh, even in non-COVID uh, patients, um, age and different, part, different comorbidities are associated with uh, worse outcome. Um, system capacity, I think it's going to come down to system capacity and making those decisions that unfortunately, uh, especially providers, physicians in Italy need to make all the time. Um, uh, staff, ICU beds, ventilators, availability. Um, I think all this needs to be taken into con consideration. I think it's going to change on a, a daily basis. One day you may be offering three ECMOs and the other day you will have no vents to offer and therefore you will have to abandon that therapy. And to help us with uh, those decisions and maybe make things a little bit more uh, clear, ELSO um, uh, issued a, a guidance document a few days ago. And I think uh, just to summarize it, it is not appropriate to say ECMO will never be considered for COVID patients. And I think, again, as I said, considering ECMO for COVID-19 should be based on a case-by-case -case, uh, decision and uh, considering all these other uh, factors. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, outcomes uh, for ECMO patients and outside China, uh, there is uh, data coming from South Korea. And again, it's a little bit too early to tell, but as of, I believe, a day, two days ago, uh, they had over 30 patients uh, supported on ECMO. They had two or three deaths. Half of the patients actually were able to be weaned, and there is still 14 or 15 patients on support. Um, and in fact, uh, also created a special tab um, in the registry uh, where we're trying to uh, gather all this data and actually uh, see and have some evidence uh, behind uh, what type of patients uh, would be appropriate and which patients actually may do well with that therapy. Excuse me, Kasia, related to this slide, uh, are, you, are these all VA ECMO or? Are this, we is all ECMO. this is all ECMO. All so this is all ECMO. Yeah, so for, for ELSO, actually, I, I didn't want to put the whole document. I thought it would be too blurry, but uh, we're talking about specifically ECMO and then um, the indication for VA ECMO would be uh, with coexisting cardiogenic shock. And do I would know, say... Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just going to say, do we know what percentage of these were VA ECMO? Because again, going back to your point one, that you know it is not appropriate to not offer VA ECMO. Uh, so uh, do we know what percentage of these in South Korea were VA or that's not that's not available. We don't know. However, I did ask that question, and I was I was told very few, uh, and I think they were probably VA V ECMO. But uh, the data for VA is just very very scarce. I would say you know again, Melissa or Amy, please chip in. But I think that uh, this is going to be in like single digit in terms of percentage. Uh, but again. Um, you know, possibly those patients are not identified early enough. And maybe had they been identified earlier, uh, this therapy uh, could work. Um, I think like my personal um, recommendation would be identify patients at risk of deterioration period. And you know, if they have comorbidities and they're older, see if you would offer that therapy and have a discussion uh, with your colleagues, with your team. I think following all the uh, biomarkers is probably excessive. Our hospital follows D-dimers, CRP, and CBC to look for um, lymphopenia as predictors of badness. Um, but uh, again, there's data for LDH, there's data for ferritin, there's data for, L um, for um, um, BNP as well. Um, in terms of frequent echocardiography, again, it comes down to exposure of your staff uh, and whether transthoracic or TE should be done depending on the views. Um, I would say if you have increasing uh, pressure demands, uh, if uh, um, you know, you're, you're able to have any hemodynamic evaluation and you're su suspecting uh, there is cardiogenic shock component, um, I think you should uh, follow that uh, ejection fraction pre uh, pretty uh, consistently and maybe even on daily basis. Um, in some, some centers, we are one of them, we have hemodynamic TE, which might be a consideration. It's a tiny little probe that is the size of an NG tube and can stay in patient's body for 72 hours. And you just hook it up to the uh, machine. And I think that can also limit um, exposure 
um, uh, for the staff. And again, consider earlier rather than as rescue uh, therapy. And then um, the last question, and that uh, uh, was uh, many patients were asking uh, uh, during this uh, kind of a chat that we're all part of, uh, what to do with a bad patient. And again, there's only, I believe, four or five patients in the United States. There was one death, from what I can tell, of a bad patient who was infected with, um, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I would say, Start with standard therapy, just like Amy said. Um, I would say MCS, additional MCS in very selected cases. And I would just be even more selected here, selective here than in a general population. You can do VV ECMO, but uh, I always worry about right ventricle. I feel right ventricle is always struggling somewhat with bad patients. And I think if you're adding a lot of flow, uh, you may be seeing more RV dysfunction. And in those cases, um, you may actually think about um, temporary RVED with an oxygenator. Um, VA ECMO, I think, is quite questionable. And uh, because of the decrease of the RV preload, you may have a lot of issues with, uh, with the VAD itself. Um, and you may think that, you know, if you have biventricular failure, the LVAD should take care of the left ventricle. You just need to deal with the right ventricle and the lungs. And then the one more thing is uh, transplant patients. Again, very, very few patients report it. There's a report from China on three patients, and interestingly, uh, three patients, they all had uh, mild courses of COVID. Um, so the question of uh, cytokine storm, is immunosuppression modifying this? Uh, it's too early to tell. Um, so in conclusion, CV complications are common in COVID patients. Pre-existing cardiac pathologies are associated with uh, higher mortality. Frequent troponin D-dimer evaluation combined with echocardiography might be useful to identify patients at risk and have those discussions earlier. At this point, there's no evidence uh, to tell patients to stop ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And VA ECMO should be considered in very selected uh, cases and mainly depending on the system capacity and a patient characteristic. And then maybe just one more statement about VA ECMO um, uh, overall. Uh, I think one thing that uh, we worry about is that there still will be non-COVID patients coming um, who may need VA ECMO support. And I kind of foresee a young patient who comes in VT storm due to proximal LAD STEMI in the cath lab. Um, and I think the question will be, you know, do we have the capacity to put a non-COVID patient on support knowing that the outcome will probably be very good. And I worry that we'll, meet, we'll be facing those questions as well. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was just so much uh, informative and uh, you did such a great job of you know, putting a lot of information in those few slides. And uh, let me start with one question quickly. Uh, and that is related, you raised so many points, honestly, I have so many thoughts in my mind, but the one question I have is related to the issue of uh, I understand the issues and the uh, poor prognosis with VA ECMO. Uh, you raised the issue of timing and in the field of cardiology, uh, this uh, concept of uh, door to unload has become very hot topic as you all know. Uh, so um, the timing is very becoming more and more important. Uh, and I just feel like when you're just measuring D-dimers and because these patients have multi-organ failure, so it's very hard to know, is it from the heart? Is it from the kidney? Is it from the sepsis? You know, so is it unreasonable to have a right heart cath if you're gonna commit a patient to intubate them, put a VV ECMO and those kind of things? Is it unreasonable to have a, a right heart cath, you know, uh, have a swan so that you have a better sense of their left ventricle continuously over time uh, versus like guessing on, you know, yeah. So I, I have to say, you know, I, I'm a heart failure cardiologist, so I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, um, you know, this, been, this has been our practice actually at Abbott for the last eight years. Uh, we have uh, uh, invasive hemodynamic monitoring on all of these patients who are on the ECMO. I think assessment of uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is absolutely key. And there's really no other way to, uh, to do it. I mean, there's some attempts to do it non-invasively with echocardiograms. I think it's tricky, and it's tricky also in a setting of continuous flow. Um, I, I am a great kind of proponent of that, not mentioning that the new SKY guidelines really base the diagnosis of shock, of cardiogenic shock based on the hemodynamic parameters. So I think if possible, and I would say, if you are doing it in the cath lab, then um, just put this one in if you can. I think it might be a little trickier, especially if you're upgrading, let's say you're going from VV to VAV, 
at the bedside. Um, I think the risk of complications and the risk of tangling of the catheter and sucking it into the cannula is pretty high. Uh, back in the day, we had a couple of those complications. But if you can use fluoro and safely float it, I think looking at the whole big picture, I think it's a relatively non-invasive thing that will give you a lot of information. Kasia, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Couple of questions. Uh, some of them came through. Another one that just came up to mind. Uh, do we know the long-term outcomes of these uh, patients? Like, for example, uh, let's say they survive it. They, they decannulated, as you said, the majority get decannulated. Are they having then good recovery overall? That's yeah. one question. And then the second question is, do you follow the biomarkers like the dimer and IL-6 uh, regularly or not? Yeah, so these are great questions. I would say for the first uh, for the first question, we don't know what the what the long term outcome is, but we can extrapolate from the prior data. When you look at the ELSO registry, uh, what we actually collect is um, survival to decannulation and then survival to discharge, uh, and that is unfortunately different. So I will assume that some of these patients will definitely uh, die along the way. Um, in terms of following biomarkers, as I said, I think you need to pick up one or two. And I, in my opinion, following troponin and D-dimer in a patient at risk, and I would call a patient at risk with a pre-existing cardiovascular condition, like we said, those three are probably good enough, you know, coronary disease, diabetes, and um, hypertension. Um, I think it's relatively easy and cheap to do, and I think it can give you a lot of information in terms of long-term prognosis for COVID. Okay, Chef uh, Subash, uh, two quick questions on the chat line. One that you have kind of answered is the withholding of ACE and ARBs. Uh, the recommendation clearly at this point is no. Could you elaborate on the role of, of early anticoagulation in such patients in, in case you encounter them in your practice or yeah. should we? Yeah, so um, thank you for this question. Um, I would say um, I don't think there is uh, enough evidence right now to do something different for these patients in terms of anticoagulation. And again, Amy and Melissa, please, you know, if you have a difference in opinion, I would say for now we would just do standard what we do. We have a PTT based protocols with heparin for these patients, and, I, and we would follow that. Wonderful. I'm going to, uh, for the sake of time, move on. And uh, we, again, we're going to have Q&A at the end. So I love the discussion. And please send your questions via the chat. And uh, thank you, Manos and Subash, for entertaining these questions. So the next presentation is going to be very practical. And my partner, Dr. Mark Pelletier, uh, is going to talk about the practical aspect of VV and VA ECMO for COVID-19 patients, who, where, when, how. Uh, you can imagine the challenges with uh, doing such a thing in a COVID-positive patient. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mehdi, and I would, I would preface that by saying that um, as opposed to some of our colleagues across the country, we have not yet seen the surge that we're anticipating. So a lot of this has been planning. It's occurred with a lot of great people in our institution, our intensivists, uh, anesthesia, cardiology, cardiac surgery, um, and we have learned a lot from our colleagues throughout the world. So um, we've had one patient so far on ECMO, um, and that patient was decannulated after uh, three to four days. Uh, but we expect that there'll be more. Um, this was touched upon a little bit earlier, uh, and these are the ELSO guidelines through the guidance document that came out a few days ago. Uh, I think a lot of these, um, especially some of the contraindications, which are either relative or absolute, will change as resources change uh, and all that. But this, I think, was an important document that ELSO put out, uh, and I, I believe it was shared earlier, so I won't go over this uh, too much. I wanted to speak maybe a little bit practically about what we have designed. So within university hospitals, we have a series of multiple hospitals uh, with one main academic center. Uh, so we have formulated a triage center, a transfer re referral center. Now, we already had something like this established for a shock program. So meaning that patients who were in cardiogenic shock at any outlying hospital could call this number. There's a shock team that gets activated. Uh, people get on the phone and discuss the case. So we've implemented this uh, for our ECMO COVID patients, and not just for the ones that will need ECMO, but for the ones that are needing accelerating care. And as we try to define regionally where we'll try to put these patients and trying to understand that if we can maybe have some of them that are not as sick, that can be at some of the more satellite programs, a bit smaller hospitals, and reserve Cleveland Medical Center, which is our main quaternary hospital for the sicker patients that may require ECMO, uh, that's what we're trying to do. So on that call, within a few minutes, we'll be the attending physician who's taking care of that patient, 
an attending ICU physician who's in charge of the ICU systems that day, a cardiac surgeon who's on call, interventional cardiologist. And then we'll, we'll ensue a discussion about that patient with all the points that were noted before. Uh, demographics, the patient situation, uh, RESP score, uh, all the th D-dimers, all the scores of, of the things that my colleagues have talked about. And, and based on that, we'll try to make a decision. Um, we have three levels of, of care for patients that are not as sick, but for the m ones that are most sick, we'll try to make sure that you know, the appropriate criteria have been outlined, that code status has been discussed, palliative consults have been discussed, the rest parameters have been discussed, and then we'll try to find the best place for that patient. For our sickest patients, this will be Cleveland Medical Center where we have approximately five ICUs. We've refurbished one to be COVID and plans for possibly a second and a third, depending on how this surge will evolve. What's nice about those calls is that not one person has to share the burden of saying no, because I expect, and we already have had one call where we said no, and it's um, tremendously helpful when people are coming together and able to do this uh, together. Um, we expect that we will have probably one, if any of you know Cleveland, there's an Eastern and a Western part. We expect that we'll have probably one center of excellence on the East side, one on the West side, um, but that really all of our sickest patients will be transferred to Cleveland Medical Center. So in terms of, as we've tried to plan this out, one of the things that has come about is, is where can we initiate ECMO? Uh, in reality, as we've done with our shock program, we can theoretically initiate ECMO at any hospital. We have a traveling ECMO team, so we would have, uh, similar to when we go on a donor run for a heart transplant or a lung transplant, we would have a team that would need a Cleveland Medical Center. They pick up all, all the supplies. That team consists of typically the surgeon, the first assistant, and a perfusionist. And then they'll take in, be taken by van to the location where we need to put that place, patient on ECMO. And then that patient will be stabilized on ECMO, cannulated, and then brought back to Cleveland Medical Center. Now, COVID-19 brings about a totally different set of circumstances in which ideally we don't want to be going around and doing this at many different locations. We'd really like to locate these patients at, at our center of excellence for a lot of reasons that are pretty obvious uh, to, to take a group of people that are used to doing that. In terms of what room, um, and Amy alluded this er, to this earlier, we feel that probably the best location to place most of these patients, keeping in mind they will be on BV ECMO, is probably the ICU. It can be done in the emergency room, the cath lab, a hybrid OR, but frankly, uh, the imaging required for BV ECMO is not nearly as stringent as it is for, uh, let's say, an Avalon cannula for that type of BV ECMO or even VA ECMO. So I think for most patients, we can do that quite safely uh, in the ICU. The advantage of the ICU is that these, this healthcare team is used to taking care of these patients. There's an ante room before we actually get into the patient's room. And I'll get into some of the things that we found I think uh, are quite important. In terms of who can initiate ECMO, we've decided that right now we will limit it to really physicians who are not just certified, but have experience with uh, ECMO. Um, that in our center is primarily cardiac surgeons and interventional cardiologists. Uh, Medi, as many of you may know, runs a fabulous ECMO course and many people have been certified. Uh, we reached out to all the people who've been certified and uh, we've had an excellent response. We had discussed because really in terms of VV ECMO, it's like inserting two huge cannulas. So typically there are a lot of people who have that skill. It may be emergency room physicians, anesthesiologists and other colleagues, uh, but we've really decided not to expand it to other people. I think there's so many things that can go wrong. I think it has to be people that are quite used to doing it. And so far, uh, this has been our strategy. For initiation of ECMO at an outside hospital, as I mentioned earlier, we have an ECMO kit that will be picked up by one of our surgical assistants. Uh, our first assistants, along with the perfusionist and the surgeon or the interventional cardiologist, will meet at the hospital, similar to donor run, stabilize that patient and bring that patient back. Uh, although, again, that is really, our, really not our preferred strategy, but something that we'll have to look at. Um, this is really a brief list of equipment, but really would talk about some of the really important types of things that you need to have ready uh, in an ECMO cart, ideally, that's located within uh, your ICU. Uh, some of that will involve some short, short uh, sheets for venous access. An Edwards dilator kit we think is excellent because it has multiple size dilators to it. In terms of the venous cannulas, keep in mind that your inflow cannula really is the important one. The size of that cannula should be maximized of course, to the patient's body size and index to that. But the inflow cannula really should be, in, in theory, the, the bigger one. The outflow cannula 
can be even smaller than a 22, but most Venus cannulas are, are around 21, 22 in smallest size. Um, it's important, we think, to have a stiff wire of some sort, whether it's an Amplatz, extra stiff, st super stiff, whatever your preference is, or Lunderquist, but just to have that available. A regular wire can cannulate most people, but to have a stiff wire, I think, is helpful. Uh, a bunch of clamps, bulb syringes, and, and sutures. Some things just to think about, and um, some are philosophical and some are, are just to discuss with your team, really to try to keep it simple. And I think that's where the strategy of cannulating these people in the MICU in the ICU bed in their own bed, I think is, is important. It avoids transportation, it keeps it in one location. I, I do think, as Amy said earlier, the femoral site is probably better. It avoids the neck area. And I know people are gowned, but if the ventilator comes, becomes disconnected, things of that nature, it's maybe nice to avoid the head area. And I think for what we're trying to accomplish, at least in terms of initiation of ECMO, and keep in mind, you can always change your cannulation strategy a little bit later on, but to keep it simple, femoral, femoral, I, I think is probably the safest and, and easiest way to do it. Again, a big inflow cannula and a smaller outflow cannula. As we've learned, the deterioration of these patients can be rapid. And what that means is sometimes teams can get very uh, panicked or rushed, but this is so important to try to avoid that. And as some of the leaders and people that are involved in this, how we conduct ourselves is so important to how the team will, will respond. One of the things that we learned from one of the patient, the patient we did put on ECMO is that if we can batch these procedures with ECMO, I think that's important. In this patient, a bit later, somebody had to go in and put an IV, which exposes more people to that uh, patient. So if we can batch procedures with ECMO, whether it be an art line, an IV, a central line, I think it's a good time to do it. And what we've also learned is that the, the resource nurse role is so essential. So somebody who's really watching the donning, doffing of the team, entrance, exit into the room, can facilitate the gathering of supplies if something is missing and, and charting and, and donor entry. Uh, this was provided by some of our friends across the street at the Cleveland Clinic and really is a bit of an algorithm in terms of how you might consider uh, doing this in terms of having your people, getting them together, having all your resources and really minimizing when you're opening that door, when you're moving into and out of that room. Uh, and I, I found that this was uh, helpful and, and this will be shared. Uh, the positioning of the bed and the people who are in that room uh, is important. It'll obviously change a lot on the configuration of your ICU rooms and what you have available. Uh, but typically, you would have a surgeon or cardiologist cannulating along with an assistant and hopefully a, a nurse. Uh, and you will have to have a perfusionist coming into and out of that room at some point. Again, the configurations can change a little bit, but these are some of the basic uh, configurations that we think will work for most people. This was alluded to earlier, and uh, Amy showed some nice uh, pictures of this. Uh, this is really what we think is probably the simplest cannulation strategy. So that places an inflow cannula, typically in the IVC at the level of the liver and ideally below. All the deoxygenated blood will come into the circuit, and your outflow cannula is located ideally in your right atrium, and then will be passed on. Uh, with the, in, a, in a perfect world, we think that the scenario of the uh, femoral cannulation for inflow and internal jugular for outflow is ideal. And again, if your patient has a central line already in the neck, this may be the best way to go. Um, and I, I would say between these two scenarios, you can probably cannulate and get 99% or more of patients on ECMO. Uh, we love the Avalon cannula at our institution, but I would also agree with Amy that it's probably not the best strategy for these patients. You really want to put an Avalon cannula with some form of um, uh, imaging, either TE or, or fluoroscopy, which involves really moving that patient to another environment. I think if that patient's already in another environment and you're making a decision to go to the cath lab or the hybrid OR, you can certainly think about this. Uh, but I think for us, Avalon cannulas in these patients is not what we're going to do. Uh, some people have talked about a Protec duo with an oxygenator if there's a significant amount of RV failure. I think, again, this is a creative option, certainly can be done, uh, but again, would be kind of our fourth option on the list. Once these patients are put on ECMO, then the issue becomes of maintenance. Uh, they're all located typically in one geographical area. We think that that's really important. Uh, they have to be cared for by members of the ICU team. And um, as a colleague at Brigham and Women's Aaron Waxman put on yesterday, this is very intensive care, you know, the donning and doffing of all these uh, gowns. And, and so this will uh, be very labor intensive. Uh, in our center currently, we feel that we have capacity uh, that would be a surge capacity of putting 15 patients on ECMO at one time, but 
uh, we have uh, capability of reconfiguring other existing equipment and doing more, but hopefully we will not need uh, that many. The duration of support uh, has been an issue that I think a lot of people are talking about, and it's been incredible in this day and age of social media how much information that we're getting from colleagues uh, across the world. Uh, it, the, the general consensus is that our patient who had three, four days of support, that's an anomaly. Most patients will require a lot more than that. Uh, there needs to be kind of a formal multidisciplinary meeting about these patients uh, at certain intervals of time, whether it's seven days or, or that can be a bit different. Uh, but failure to show clinical improvement, I think, has to be evaluated very carefully. The ELSO document suggested that observing no lung or cardiac recovery after 21 days, uh, ECMO may be considered futile and the patient can be returned to conventional management. Of course, that will vary by patient and how that patient is doing, um, but something to consider. Uh, the other part, and this came from some of our colleagues at UPMC, were stopping rules, because I think for a lot of these patients, um, we will need to establish some stopping rules. And whether they be neurologic or pulmonary or cardiovascular or GI, uh, there are many of these things that if they do develop with these patients, uh, you know, our, the adage, oh, let's just shoulder on, let's foster on, maybe is not appropriate for these patients. And we feel that these are stopping rules that are probably quite appropriate for these patients. That if these types of things develop, really consideration to a hard stop should be uh, given for those patients. So, Mehdi, thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, listen, thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic uh, again. And uh, one question I ask quickly uh, is, uh, I think Kasha also mentioned this, uh, is related that we all have limited number of these ECMO machines. And you would, I don't know how to put this ethically, but you know, you, you may not want to uh, commit someone, I, I just want to emphasize this and get your input and then we can discuss it even later. Uh, commit your uh, very precious equipment like you said we have 15 we can do maybe we can do 18 we have limited number of these kind of equipment that we can use and commit these to folks that are futile because of various reasons because of comorbidities age and others when then you have a patient in cardiogenic shock you know that's coming with a vt storm or a left main or something or lad and you don't have equipment to give it to them and um, just any comments you have about that i think one more time may be helpful because we may be anxious to put these things but then you, you may be burned later on. I, I, I can't emphasize enough, I think, the multidisciplinary aspect of discussing these patients. Um, all, I think for all of us probably on this call, saying no to anybody is the hardest thing that we can do, right? Um, but when you're talking to your colleagues about it and you're saying no together as a group of four or five, I, I just think that's essential. That did occur to us already in one, in one case. It was a 71-year-old man already in shock, on level fed, kidneys were failing, and I think we all felt strongly together that we should say no, as difficult as that was. I think there is um, there's tremendous comfort and power that comes from discussing these people together. Wonderful. Uh, I was going to ask Melissa to go next, uh, and then we can open it up for Q and A. I think she may have lost her internet. Uh, Maybe can Melissa, I ask Mark can... a question. There's a uh, sure. very interesting question in the chat line. Mark, uh, great talk and uh, enjoyed it greatly. The question on the chat line uh, is. Many of these patients with COVID may not come with RV dysfunction, but may develop RV dysfunction after the ECMO has gone in. Uh, there are some specific questions on the chat line, but I'm posing it to you in a broad sense. What is the strategy? How do you evaluate and where would you, where would you go when the RV dysfunction is pre-existing versus it develops after you uh, go on ECMO? Yeah, so um, good question. And I think there are, there are two or three options for that, broadly speaking, is one to consider these patients as cardiac failure and switch to perhaps a VA ECMO strategy, uh, as was talked about earlier. Uh, I think the other one is to think about adding a Protect Duo or an Impella for the right side of the heart. Those are a couple things that could be done. Um, frankly speaking, I think that is one big thing that would put these people in a different notch, right? A different category. And if you're on VV ECMO and you're now having to escalate to that type of extra support, Again, is it futile? Probably not in everybody, but it may probably in most. So I think that's you know a big consideration. Excellent point. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Mark and uh, Melissa, uh, Dr. Bronswald. Uh, we're going to go to her. I think she may have gotten disconnected because of internet, but I'm going to uh, kind of introduce her and hopefully she can get on. Uh, she's going to talk about a real life experience. She actually had a patient that uh, she uh, with COVID-19 positive patient that she placed on an ECMO 
VV ECMO, I believe, uh, that was able uh, later to be decannulated, and apparently patient is doing okay from what I understand. So we are very interested to learn her experience hands-on. Uh, it would be wonderful. Thanks again, Melissa. All right. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, to participate in this conference. Um, it's been very interesting so far. Um, are, are my slides up? Because my yes. internet, like you said, is not doing great for me. So I, I have nothing uh, to add in terms of disclosures, except uh, like Amy mentioned, uh, ECMO outside of cardiopulmonary bypass in the operating room is an off-label use of the technology. And um, ECMO is a team sport. I would be remiss if I didn't say that we couldn't do this without the tremendous support of all the uh, ECMO specialists and perfusionists and the bedside nurses and everybody that, that make uh, our ECMO center um, uh, function. So our case, um, like people have been mentioning, uh, is a 38-year-old male marathon runner, no comorbidities whatsoever, no smoking, no vaping, nothing at all. He travels extensively for work, um, and, and that's his only sort of risk factor. Uh, he was um, had a five-day history of a cough. He went to a different hospital for evaluation. He had a chest X-ray and a big uh, respiratory viral testing and everything, big workup at that time was all negative. Uh, COVID-19 testing was unavailable, um, just as a side note. Uh, he was uh, discharged with just instructions for supportive care. He did decide because of his extensive travel history, work history. Um, he had been in a conference uh, and there was a large number of uh, folks from, uh, that were from Asia at that conference. He decided to self-quarantine um, and he came another six days later to our hospital, University of Minnesota Medical Center. So uh, he had had 11 days of symptoms by the time he presented to our hospital. He had worsening dyspnea at that time, dehydration, malaise, he had a, a high temperature and a high respiratory rate, and he was saturating 90% on nine liters face mask. He got single doses at that time of azithromycin and ceftriaxone as a, um, empiric therapy for community acquired pneumonia. Uh, and then he went into Florida ARDS. These are his just representative slices from his imaging at that time. And over that, he was admitted over the next 12 hours, he just he had the same uh, picture that everybody has been talking about. He became progressively hypoxemic. He was intubated, prone, paralyzed, inhaled epoprostenol, um, and his oxygen saturations, no matter what they tried, they just were uh, in the tank uh, around 60 to 70% on maximum ventilator settings. Uh, and so the decision was made to place him on ECMO, VV ECMO, and just prior to cannulation, the COVID-19 testing that he had at our institution came back positive. So you can see there he had a PDF ratio in our institution right at that time for, for a few hours while they were really struggling with all the rescue strategies in the 60s. So this is a, a picture in his room. You can see he had, was on CRT. Um, one, the one nurse across there who didn't uh, uh, pass any fit testing, did wear the PAPR, but the rest of the folks were wearing the N95 masks in the room. So that's, that's his uh, room, negative airflow room. Uh, he got hydroxychloroquine and then he got a short course of hydroxychloroquine that completed. And then the uh, study was released that showed the patients who had the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin um, and even though that has some some definite problems with it, folks kind of looped back around and and decided to give him another uh, trial of the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. He got one. We're a center for the remdesivir trial. He got one dose of it, remdesivir, but he he was in renal failure, so mm -hmm. he didn't get any more of that. Um, um, we are also a center for. Um, uh, an ARB trial, so an ARB as a protective mechanism. So uh, because the way the um, 
the virus gets into the cell is through the angiotensin uh, 2 receptor. Uh, there is a, a, some thought that perhaps the angiotensin receptor blocker could slow the progression of the disease in, peop in people who have early disease. So not somebody who's on ECMO who's had 11 days of symptoms. This guy wouldn't be a, a, a candidate for that, but uh, he wouldn't. So he's not a candidate to participate in that trial. And then he did get, uh, he had a cytokine storm, and so he got IL-6 um, receptor blocker, uh, tocilizumab, uh, for high IL-6 um, a cytokine storm, and his IL-6 numbers did come down nicely with that. So those were the kind of unusual. Otherwise, he got a, had a relatively usual ECMO course, uh, 12 days of ECMO. Um, uh, the one thing of note about the these patients is they have a high, a high, high, difficult, very rubbery secretions, which he also had necessitating actually a tube change for for uh, endotracheal tube blockage from rubbery secretion. So he had to have his tube changed one day. So he was decannulated on day 12. Um, and then, and this was the first successful case for COVID uh, ECMO, VV ECMO to our knowledge. But he's still on mechanical ventilation, but he's recovering nicely. So I just, I, I wanted to say that this case really fits the, what we've been hearing from all of the, you know, China, the experiences from our friends in Seattle, um, the, our friends in uh, Emory all say the same sort of phases of the disease. There's a prodrome where people just feel cruddy um, with maybe some GI symptoms like nausea or diarrhea that kind of viral achiness all over that people feel I'm just I, something's wrong, I'm getting sick feeling. And then um, that tachypnea fits in, that symptomatic feeling. This is when people start showing up, uh, you know, in the emergency room for, for testing, or maybe they're sitting at home thinking, I don't know if I need testing. They start to, to have the cough. Um, they maybe, if they are admitted, they're having the thick secretion, something like that. This is the, the same picture that he displayed, you know, maybe five days of something sort of low, um, low symptomatic. And then, you know, at five days, a lot of folks who have mild disease start to feel better. Uh, five to seven days, maybe they start to feel better and even are on their way home. Or um, this is when uh, one of the the folks that I heard uh, speak from Emory called it the struggle bus. Uh, they get on the struggle bus at this point um, and they start to really look sort of sick. And this is when they move to the ICU. So now we're talking about a week out. That's when people start to deteriorate. Um, and this is when you're talking about starting to go towards intubation um, and more mechanical support, same as our guy. And then the respiratory collapse, just like our gentlemen, might, they might spiral downward in a day uh, or in two days, something like that. And um, our gentleman had relatively normal compliance, just like uh, what uh, Amy was talking about, normal compliance, but still requiring high PEEP. They have pulmonary edema. They have single organ failure, maybe plus some renal failure. Um, uh, or a little bit of elevated transaminases, uh, but not, they don't seem very sick. They're not typically very shocky, for example, something like that. But they have these thick, thick, thick secretions. And secretion management is, is one of the real keys that we hear from all the centers uh, that people talk about. Again, no shock. So again, back to the admission, most people have a cough. Uh, only about 40% uh, of people have a fever when they're at first admitted, but 88% of the pe patients develop a fever when they're admitted. So, and then they have this rapidly rising CRP. So, and then late, and this is what um, Kasha was talking about, late people just 
They start to get better. They get extubated. It seems like they're on their way towards being well, and then suddenly they die. Um, and this either has been linked either to a cytokine storm, um, myocarditis, People have thought perhaps it's a viral myocarditis, although uh, recent um, electron microscopy kind of belies that, thinks maybe it's not going to be a viral, viral myocarditis, uh, but it looks like very low ejection fraction, 10%. Suddenly people go into just fulminant cardiomyopathy with malignant arrhythmias. VT, VF, um, that just are not recoverable. And this is one of the reasons why people are wondering if either mechanical circulatory support might help or if, in fact, it would be futile and that it wouldn't help because it doesn't have the typical picture of a viral myocarditis that might be supported for four or five days and then um, have some resolution. So I'm interested to hear what people think about that. So this is what I'm describing. This was the Chinese experience where a lot of folks, it looks, you know, this fever cur curve looks the same. The cough looks the same. The dyspnea looks the same. The ICU admission looks the same. And then suddenly people just don't do well. And so that's the thing. It was difficult to see. Um, this was uh, printed in the, in the Lancet article. Um, um, one of the things that is a marker of prognosis, you know, that where people fell out is the elevated D-dimer. So the question is, could this be pulmonary bed microthrombosis? And could we actually make a difference in these patients by separate from ECMO anticoagulating early? You know, maybe this would be something that's, that um, could be one of the keys. Uh, and our patient actually did have an elevated D-dimer um, initially, and it did come down over time. So we were worried. We kept kind of biting our nails, you know, is this going to be one of those guys? Um, the other thing I mentioned about the elevated IL-6, our guy did have an elevated IL-6, um, and we did give the tocilizumab, like I said, and that came down. So the cytokine storm. Um, and then uh, the, cardi the troponins is the other thing um, that uh, Dr. Ranowitz was mentioning as a possibility, as a, as a marker for badness late here. You can see um, it's coming in sort of late. Look for those elevated troponins uh, as something. And we just kept checking the troponins uh, and checking the echo just to see because I, I just kept worrying, you know, is this going to happen to me? You know, is this guy going to turn around in a bad way? But um, he never had an elevated troponin ever, never. And he, he was always hyperdynamic and never had any kind of sign that he was um, had a low injection fraction or anything like that. So this one was always in his favor. So that's our gentleman. Uh, I kind of rushed through that a little bit, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was fantastic. And congratulations, you know, for your work and your team your work uh, well, thank you. in helping that patient. And I hope that he gets extubated soon and he's a, yeah. a huge victory for all of you guys, all of us, and for him. I have a quick question related to, uh, uh, you know, is it, do you have in your hospitals standard protocol as to when the ECMO team should be activated. So I don't work in the MICU. Mark, my partner, doesn't work in MICU. I don't know if you guys work in MICU. We are like a different kind of an entity, right? So do you mm -hmm. have protocols in your institutions, Melissa, where you say, you know what, if these three are met, if these two are met, activate the ECMO team and then we come and evaluate yeah. so that we don't get to the late phase. Yeah. Yeah, so I am a, an acute care surgeon. I'm a general surgeon um, who's, uh, who uh, it was interesting for me to hear Mark talk about who cannulators are. In our institution, the cannulators are the acute care surgeons. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it just happens to be that that was who was interested. We were interested in, uh, in it. Um, that cardiac surgeons were not at the time when we were building the program. So the, we 
Um, and so we have a really close relationship since we are um, intensivists along with the medical intensivists. Um, we go to a lot of the same critical care meetings. And as a result, we're able to develop the protocols together um, just by being in the same room a lot. The, we ask them when they start to think about proning, that they start to think about ECMO. So that whenever they're thinking proning, that's when they start to, it comes to their head, okay, I'm thinking about ECMO. Um, same thing if they think about PaO2 to FiO2 ratio less than 150, that they think about it. Not that they have to do, not, we're not doing it then, but this is when they start the conversations. So that we're that we're not crashing on ECMO all the time, but that we're having controlled conversations with plans. When is this going to be a good time? You know that we get a chance to to have these same conversations about you know palliative care and code status and um, uh, do we do our all of our cannulations in the ICU. Um, and that everything is nice and easy and planned and um, together, you know, if we have any coags to correct or anything to move, we move them from the medical intensive care over to the surgical intensive care. And then uh, we start managing them um, as soon as they're considered uh, for ECMO. Um, and so that's, that's the idea. So we just start having those conversations when when we start to talk about proning, when your PaO2 to FiO2 gets below 150, when you're starting to employ rescue strategies, that's when we start having these conversations. And then that way, you know, when it gets below 120, when it gets below 100, we're ready to go, we're planned, and we're not crashing on. Amy, I wanted to ask, I don't know if Subash and uh, Manos have questions from the chat room or themselves, but I can ask one more quick question from Amy. Um, Amy, uh, you know, can you, uh, are there any, uh, there are people are being very creative and very innovative these days. For example, putting two patients on the same ventilator. Uh, are there, are, if you're running out of uh, ECMO machines, are there alternative ways of uh, trying to address oxygenation, you know, using tandem heart, connecting it to oxygenator? Can you comment on some creative ways that potentially people can use to oxygenate people if they are running out of ECMO machines? Sure, when this started, I kind of went through our inventory of what did we have and in what order would we use uh, different supplies. So we typically use CardioHelp as a backup. We have Centromag as a backup to that. We have Biomedicus pumps that the liver transplant team uses so we can add an oxygenator into that circuit. We have tandem heart circuits so we can add into that. Um, if you mm -hmm. truly had to, you could use a bypass circuit. Um, obviously, that's a little bit more labor intensive and would require uh, perfusion to be very involved. And for instance, the bypass oxygenators only last about 12 hours, so it would have to be changed often. Um, and then also, and then thankfully, our children's hospital offered to let us use their equipment, um, feeling that they would likely not need as much um, as they have during this time. So they offered that we could borrow equipment from them if needed uh, to meet the demand. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, this year one question, I, maybe. Oh, go ahead. I just say this year I, I hooked a pediatric oxygenator into the Prisma machine. So you can flow uh, 500 through the Prisma machine. So I did that for an adult. Okay. Perfect. Um, just, just things with the way, you can football. Before you ask your question, I want to let everybody know because you know we may time we may run out of time. Uh, all of these slides will be posted on cardiovascularinnovations.org uh, website uh, for free for anyone uh, that is interested. Uh, you know our partners. I'm hoping that they agree to have these slides as PDF to be on the website so folks can use this information. And if our guests are willing, if they have any algorithms, anything that they want to share. We are more than happy. I can tell you we had over 200 participants just on this webinar so far, more than 200. Uh, so if there are protocols and uh, things that you want to share, we are more than happy to uh, put it on our uh, cvinnovations.org to have people to uh, access it for free without any charge uh, at will. Manos, you had a question. 
And I think last one, I think time to finish, but again, thanks very much. Very impressive. Congratulations on uh, saving this patient. I guess two questions. One is the remdesivir apparently is running out and there's no access. So practically, is that an option or not? And the second question is from your patient, looks like it's been what, three or four weeks. So if you get a, a critical mass of those patients, I mean, would it would be feasible to treat them for several weeks until recovery, given the current system. So the remdesivir we get on the trial, um, and we are um, in our trial. We're uh, our center is meant to um, enroll eight patients. The other thing is, it was just declared an orphan drug, and it's very expensive. So probably people can only afford to to have it on the trial. Um, we probably can't afford to get it any other way. So that's one thing. It's probably not. Um, a practical outside of the trial. Um, and regarding the other patients, uh, if pa if patients aren't going, I mean, they'll they'll need to be. I think if we wind up with a thousand patients in our system that are all on uh, mechanical ventilation for three weeks that's going to really over, overwhelm our system. So whether they were on ECMO for part of that or not, that's going to be hard. We're, we're going to need, out in Minnesota, it's expected that we will start to see patients uh, really peak in the middle of April and or start to crest in the middle of April. And the peak is supposed to be around May 1st or something like that. And, you know, it, if we can flatten that out at all, we, we, we will need to flatten it out or we're going to be in trouble. We can't like have long one more run. practical question, if that's okay. You know, Mark uh, yeah. and Tasha, if you can, the two of you can comment on this question. As we heard, as the number of patients go up, and we know that about 10 to 15 percent of the infectants are healthcare workers. And if you are working in such a close proximity with patients with COVID, you know, people that are intubated with COVID, you're putting ECMO in patients with COVID. What are you doing to protect your team, making sure that you have people that are talented, uh, like Melissa, like Amy, like you, like uh, Mark, uh, to be able to deal uh, and be able to carry the flag forward in the months or weeks ahead? Can you comment, both of you, Kasia and Mark, uh, about what are you doing to protect people and how are you managing your team to deal with this? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I'm not going to talk about the the the, um, uh, the protective uh, equipment, but our team. So our uh, heart, advanced heart care team serves as a shock team in our hospital. And there are six physicians and there are seven and PPAs. So we actually uh, adjusted our schedule um, completely. We actually. I uh, want to make sure that there is always a backup plan and there is like down to like when we're down to like two or three positions. Um, we're actually taking now call like for seven days and that will allow also a potential identification of patients, of, of doctors who are uh, NPs who are infected. Um, so we really like just redid the whole structure of uh, how we take call and how we manage those patients. And we eliminated a floor person, we eliminated a procedure person, we have an ICU uh, physician that is um, uh, just one person per team. So. Uh, similar to us, Mehdi, we've tried to really kind of limit certain uh, number of people in, in certain procedures, certainly in the cath lab, trying to min minimize the number of trainees that are there. Um, you know, it, we had one of our perfusionists who tested positive last week, and we had to test 30, 40 individuals on our heart surgery team. Fortunately, they were all negative. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is going to evolve a lot, and I think it'll be some of the things that Kasha mentioned uh, we'll have to move to that. We haven't done anything too, too much in terms of call schedules or rotation schedules yet, uh, but I think that that will come. Certainly cardiac surgery, you know, our, our cardiac surgery volume is down significantly by probably 60, 70 percent, uh, and so our, we'll find lots of stuff for our surgeons to do. Yeah, and maybe I'm just going to add that, you know, our institution actually stopped all the elective procedures, uh, which also, you know, freed up a lot of stuff, and that includes, then Manos can, can comment on it a little bit more, but also freed up um, interventionalists as well. And we also moved to like a lot of virtual visits. I would say over 90% of our clinic visits um, are virtual. 
Um, so people are staying at home and hopefully safer than, you know, being exposed and being in the hospital. And hopefully that way we can preserve more physicians, you know, for the longer period of time. Well, I want to take the, the time now, you know, to thank you all. You know, I know this, we decided to do this 48 hours ago and you've been so wonderful, all four of you, for giving us your expertise, your time, uh, putting the slides together and sharing your knowledge during these times with all of us. As I said, many people are really interested to learn, know about different algorithms, thought process. All of this is new and to have folks like you synthesize the information and also use your own experience to help us out uh, with the patients that you have dealt with uh, is very great. I really appreciate you all and want to thank you. I'm sure Manos and Subash want to say something too. So thank you so much from my perspective. Yes, thank, no, thank you. you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. It was a wonderful presentation and great interaction. So, and uh, as Mehdi said, the presentation in, in its entirety will be posted on our website. So people will have access to this information. Fantastic job. Thank you again. Thank you and good luck. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. including Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for including me. Thank you. Bye-bye.